Hi, I'm Florence Ferrialt, and I'd like to talk to you today about the antique Japanese dolls and their relationship with Western world dolls that are more familiar to many of us. It is a mystery to me that this rich and highly artistic genre of doll collecting has remained largely unexplored by Western world doll collectors. Perhaps it's something as simple as language barriers, for, admittedly, Japanese is not a common language taught in American schools. Yet how easy to start from this simple lesson. It's simple. Nino means doll. Or perhaps it is a feeling that these dolls are too strange, too apart from the common doll experience of Western children and Western doll collectors. We are taught that they are formal, stylized, historic, and never, never play dolls. Yes, they are different, but they are also the same. In this video, I aim to describe their commonalities with the European dolls that American collectors already so avidly seek. First, in both cultures, doll making by the early 1800s had become an established industry. The wooden court dolls of France, the wooden dolls created in England for the aristocracy, superb Neapolitan sculpted dolls with extraordinary silk costumes and highly characterized features are all examples of these industry centers in Europe. The same was true of Japan. Take just one comparison, Paris, France, and Kyoto, Japan. Just as Paris was the center of French doll making in the 18th and 19th centuries, so was Kyoto, the center of Japanese doll making at that time. Small studios buzzed with activity throughout both cities, and, not incidentally, both cities were also considered the apex of artistic and intellectual pursuits in all regards. And just as the Paris doll world was composed of a number of small ateliers, so was that of Kyoto. Even the construction of the dolls, which was largely a matter of assembly of parts from various specialists, wigs from one atelier, textiles and costumes from another, carved wooden parts from still one more, was a similar pattern in both Paris and Kyoto. As a result, early 1800s dolls from both cultures were largely identified by the shop which sold the doll rather than the assembler. For example, Collectors of French poupées might speak of their Simone doll, although Simone was a doll shop, not a doll maker. And although collectors of Japanese dolls speak with reverence of Marahai, he was actually not a doll maker. He was a supplier of dolls to the imperial family, choosing and acquiring dolls and accessories from various specialists and presenting them under his name. Another comparison, secondly, just as wood or paper mache was the most prevalent material used in doll making in Europe during the 1700s and early 1800s, so too was that the case in Japan. In both cultures, the carving, sculpting, and finish on the dolls reflected current notions of beauty or refinement. The aquiline nose of the European aristocracy and the distinctive sky brows of dolls of Japanese nobility as examples. In Japan, the smooth and flawless complexion, referred to as gofen, was achieved by multi-layers of finely pulverized shells, an extraordinary task. In Europe, the complexion was achieved by smooth gesso under layered and finely rendered paint. And in both cultures, the eyes were ordinarily painted until the early mid-1800s, when enamel and glass eyes entered their construction. Third comparison. Costuming was of utmost concern in both worlds. Thus, in both, both cultures, the bodies of the early dolls, except exposed hands and feet, were crude and simplistic. Because these early dolls were swathed with luxury fab fabrics that were permanently affixed, the hidden body was of little consequence, except that it be durable. Fourth comparison. In both cultures, the doll body began to be important beginning tentatively in the late 1700s and reaching full bloom by the mid to late 1800s. Now dolls were being designed with a notion of dress, undress, redress, and so the style of body began to change to accommodate this. At this time in Japan, the flexible padded upper arm was introduced to allow the doll to be easily undressed, as well as the Mitsuwari Ninyo, or triple jointed doll, designed for articulated play. Meanwhile, in Europe, the early notion of tacking on or stitching the costume to the body evolved into costumes with drawstrings or hooks and eyes, and the design of a doll body that was realistic as well as malleable became an industry obsession. 
hence the development of the fully articulated wooden body that we know so well in Western world doll collecting. And notably, in a delightful confluence of the two worlds, it was the Japanese Mitsuori Nino, the triple-jointed doll, presented by Dutch traders at the London Universal Exhibition of 1851 that is said to have been the major influence on the development of the Western articulated child doll. A fifth comparison. Entire industries concerning the costuming of a doll grew up in each culture. It is often remarked upon by admiring collectors of 18th and 19th century Western dolls that even the scale of the woven pattern of fabric was miniaturized to match the size of the doll. So too was this true with the Japanese dolls. And the use of woven symbols, the fleur de in France, the chrysanthemum in Japan, for example, is a commonality, just as the presence of luxury fabrics signaled the importance of a doll. In both cultures, velvets, brocades, or other fabrics with interwoven gold or sil silver threads were important statements of prestige. And in both cultures, sumptuary laws, which changed over time, decreed which classes could wear which fabrics. Sixth commonality, just as the Western dolls celebrated their heroes and heroines in the form of dolls, from Empress Eugenie to Queen Victoria to George Washington, so do, too did the Japanese, from Empress Jingo to the Emperor Hideyoshi. And finally, seventh, what a play. There is a commonly held belief that Japanese ninyo were not play dolls. True, and yet not true. They were not play dolls in the rough-and-tumble sense that we often associate with American play, Yet they were play in that they were designed to visually stir the imagination, to teach proper societal roles, to instill a sense of fashion and style. Not unlike, in fact, their counterpart English wooden court dolls or French bisque poupées with fashionable trousseau and elaborate coiffures. Further, the notion that Western world dolls were all subjected to vigorous play is distorted. In fact, in the 1800s, owning a, quote, store-bought doll uh, was a luxury, and many a story has been recounted that, quote, my doll was kept stored away and I was only allowed throughout my childhood to bring it out of its box at Christmas to display it under the holiday tree, unquote. The extraordinary history of Japanese dolls, Japanese ningyo, has been told in two superb books by Alan Scott Pate, which I highly recommend. This video is not that. It is not a history or technical study of those remarkable dolls, but only seeks to show their similarities with Western culture dolls. So let's begin with the subject of lady dolls. These include ladies of the royal courts, fashionable society ladies, and courtesans. Entire books have been written about the culture and costuming of courtesans in Japan, and it's a very unique culture that we're not as familiar with in the Western world. One of the things that's very distinctive is the front-tied obi. Rather than a, more of a simple sash tied in the back on the courtesan, it's tied in the front and very, very pronounced size and very, very dominant in its presentation. Their thickly padded, multi-layered kimonos were designed to give an illusion that when they were walking, they would have a more sensuous type of walk. Another presentation of the courtesan with her procession, which was very often done. Notice the obi here with a wonderful painted dragon, embroidered dragon on the front of the obi, and the glass eyes. Very, very distinctive and wonderfully done. Notice the variegated threads that are used in the design and her wonderfully painted face. The painted lower green lip was, was a notion that that would look black in, in darkness and it would be a very sensuous look and you're seeing the flying crane design on her sleeve, her wonderful embroidery all over, and a back view of her, her kimono worn in this very um, casual, luxurious, thrown off the shoulders look, which was very designed, wonderfully designed hair ornaments, very elaborate hair. And the design of the crane on her sleeve is just quite beautifully done with multicolored threads, and as you can see, not a simple layer, but multi-layered work. She had two attendants with her, and this was often done with the um, courtesan designs in Japan. They would be the young attendant in training, this one having, of course, again, the green lower lip, and the beautiful silk crepe color, which was a luxury color used in the Japanese um, costuming, and with the wonderful embroidery done on her costume again. And you can see it as well as she would have 
the back-tied Obi because she was only a courtesan in training. And the red, this is um, red silk crepe matching her kimono that is done for her hair piece. And again, beautiful embroidery. Notice the dots on top of the gold. So it's just like a gold woven um, threads applied to the top. And then there was the matronly. This is the retired courtesan. And she was there, I don't know why, to keep propriety going, I guess. And she also had the green lips still, but very, very beautifully designed. Thickly padded again to have a, to create a certain kind of sensual walk. Very beautifully done. The courtesan and her, att and her attendants were accompanied also by their two, I guess you would call them their two protectors. There was the gentleman wonderfully posed with his arms behind his back with the um, wooden and paper parasol. Very, very wonderfully done. And then um, the older attendant, and he has a wonderfully expressive face. And notice their textiles of their fabrics, which are very, very modern in some ways. One of them even having like a, a scotch plaid on his kimono, which is quite distinctive. The courtesans were often presented with um, their attendants at their side, and here we have another example, this very beautiful courtesan in the middle with her long hair arranged down the front of her bodice, very beautiful hair ornaments, wonderful embroidery of the costume on all of them, including cherry blossoms, overall the costume of the courtesan. And there you're seeing a back view of her, which is continues that wonderful look at the multi-layering of her sleeves. Again, a very, very distinctive and luxury look. A beautiful pair of ladies, not courtesans now, but these are just absolutely beautiful ladies and the very rare fabric of the shaded purple to cream with exquisite dainty embroidery. Note that they have different expressions on their face. We have another beautiful lady who is known as the Kyoto Bijan, which you could simply translate to mean French fashion lady. Plum silk crate, uh, kimono, with, she has vibrant red and blue flowers on it, and she's posed seated. Very, very distinctive and beautifully arranged hair. Here is the pattern on her kimono, very vibrant. And you could spend years just studying all of the different symbols and the flowers and how they were used. Another um, Kyoto Bijan, uh, or a French fashion lady. She was made about 1900. She has an especially beautiful face, and she also happens to have what you're not seeing, unusually shapely legs, very, very nice. Elegant refinement. Look at her obi, worn at the back this time. Now, again, she's a lady. She's not a courtesan, and she has the Polonia crest at the back, um, which is would be comparable to the French fleur-de-lis, a sign of, of her... Um, stature in the community and you're going to see a full view of that in just a moment a very beautifully done work and there is a polonia crest notice all of that interweaving and that embroidery on top of it and this is a detail of her obi worn at the back again a very beautiful beginning fabric of that metallic woven silk and in the front and on the obi you're then seeing her tie belt. Very, very rare to find the tie belt over the obi. We are now viewing another of the courtesan ladies, and look at her magnificent obi, oversized, extending down to the floor in the front. It is so magnificent. Her hair is fabulous. She has metal and foil ornaments, and the chairman, red, which is the red silk crepe, um, hair fabric bands in her hair, very, very exquisitely done. Notice the feathering painting of the hair around the edges of the wig. This is an extra detail which was really a luxury ornament and this is a detail of the fabric. It's absolutely universal in design. Wonderful um, embroidery interwoven. We're now going to show you a beautiful lady who's extremely rare because of her side seated pose. A very very distinctive fabric with interwoven presentation ribbons. Look at the green and yellow ribbons that are interwoven throughout her fabric. She's um, posed, not kneeling, but side seated with her little feet peeking out at the side. As you can see, very elegant posed. She was probably a portrait doll of a merchant's wife and she was likely as a, made as a private commission and it's a very, very rare genre. Look at the back of her hair. Look at the fawn, this is called fawn spot. Um, silk crate of her long train, which extends very, very far down and matches actually the hair bow ornament in her hair. That's a very magnificent, magnificent doll with a very angelic face, accented again by the feathering detail of the hair around the face. And here's a close-up of 
those interwoven presentation ribbons with the metallic thread edging them and her wonderful floral arrangement in her hair you can see up close you can see how beautifully it's made of various silks and more detail of the presentation ribbons the fabric underneath itself is really richly done and then this is appliqued over the top we have another beautiful lady another example of Kyoto Bijan which again think French fashion doll and you will realize what it is this one is dates as recently as 1930 although that's getting on to be 85 years old wearing a pale rose silk kimono with a long train at the back a fawn spot silk crepe obi and a rose cord waist tie and wonderful decorations in her hair and her elaborately arranged hair once again just as the french fashion dolls had elaborately arranged coiffures so did the ladies i wanted to show you other examples of textiles that were, were done not just with the ladies and so i've just th chosen three random dolls to show you the various textiles this particular doll was made about 1850 and he's wearing a silk brocade kimono under a green silk jacket so please note this is the kimono the, the blue and gold and on top of it is a green silk jacket sleeveless jacket with um, attached trousers that is over the top of the kimono and then under the kimono is his body armor um, with a crest and if you notice right in the middle of his chest you can see the crest design on it he has an unusual cap with um, the ban unusual banding on it and he's wearing wrist guards we now are looking at another example of wonderful fabric done, made on one of the theatrical type dolls posed in a sideways manner her head is counterposed to her hands and just I just wanted you to see some of the detail of the embroidery on her and the way the dynamic posing of the doll could be accentuated by the costume. Here you're seeing again another example of an extraordinary uh, Chinese style silk brocade costume um, with silk hakama trousers, ruffled silk collar and sleeve edging, tied sleeve closures, exceptional hair that is dramatically upswept. The man is clothed in rich textiles, including wide leg silk brocade trousers and with embroidered details of cranes on his sleeves. The dolls that, um, that most people are familiar with when they are mentioned, have Japanese dolls mentioned in their presence are the Lord and Lady dolls. They're often, re people often re think they are the emperor and the empress. This is not true. They were simply an aristocratic couple. They were nobility. Um, represented as a lord and lady and they were made over such an extensive period of time and I have some wonderful examples to show you and as much as anything I want you to think of these in relation to for example the French court dolls the dolls that were made in England for um, the aristocracy the very very wonderful English wooden dolls and think of the costuming that these different dolls would be wearing and now look at these Japanese dolls the first one you're seeing is an imperial couple these date from the early 1700s think of that we're talking 300 years ago that these dolls were made they're absolutely wonderful um, he's wearing a robe with extensive kinron which is the gold threading the, the gold um, metallic threading throughout it um, it has reflective cowl qualities that give an illusion of pattern he has a gold lacquered cap she's wearing a 12 layered kimono each layer with red silk crepe edging on their elaborately woven brocade so you can see the red silk crepe edging on all of those metallic layers very very lovely this intricate technique of kinron was first developed in china during the sung dynasty gold leaf was applied to paper which was cut in very fine strips and interwoven into silks creating infinite reflections and changeable designs it's a very very extraordinary uh, fabric and very very rare to find and to have them here in this unbelievably preserved condition almost 300 years old well more than 300 years old is absolutely remarkable the Japanese um, Hina is shown here with the very first Japanese Hina to make use of this technique and you're seeing all the layers and this wonderful close-up view of it shows the very very thin paper strips that are interwoven and they came in their original boxes by the way a different style of Japanese dolls are known as the uh, Jiro Zamon style of the imperial couple 
and very, very known to be described as line eyes dash nose for their very distinctive um, minimalist painting of the face and their ping pong ball shaped heads, very distinctive. These are from the late 1700s. Um, Gerizimone was a doll maker about 1700. He was an official supplier to the imperial family and it's very, very interesting. There's a stylized flying crane on her kimono and she has a hand painted fan with another crane on the top of it. Notice a very refined painting of her fingers. A third type of lord and lady was this rare standing imperial couple. They date from the early 1800s and notice the painted sky brows high on her forehead, a sign of her nobility. And what is particularly rare about them is not only their standing pose, but they're wearing matching gold brocade costumes. She has a 12 layer kimono over red silk trousers. She has wonderful floor length extended hair. Again, we have that in the, in the European doll makers. When they had luxury wigs, they made extended, extended um, hair lengths on them. And he's wearing the rare Eboshi court cap. Very rare to find the style and to find them is a, still a match pair over all of these years now. We're over 200 years wearing their matching gold brocade costumes is really quite remarkable. She's holding her wonderful wooden fan. A uh, fourth example of the imperial couple is made about 1850 um, in large size. He's 18 inches tall. They're known as the Takibina. Um, they have the round ping pong ball shaped head. Okay. But he has a distinctive flattened body and she has the hidden cylinder body. Their wonderful embroidery represents the three friends of winter, pine, plum, and bamboo, symbolizing longevity, a, a wonderful symbol for the pair. This handsome lord and lady are uh, known as the Yusoko couple because they were dressed according to the dictums of the Yusoko manual, which prescribed what colors and what fabrics could be worn only by members of the imperial family, and that is what they are wearing. He has a billowing outer coat, very, very simple, but it hides his multi-layers beneath, hidden folds, pockets, and a belt, and purple trousers tied at the ankles. This Yusoko manual at the time prescribed all of the rules of dress, very, very similar to what would be going on in France and in England, prescribing what the royal family, what the imperial family could wear and what other people could wear. And this is the wonderfully painted fan she holds. Once again, could I point out the similarity to the various accessories worn by French fashion dolls at the time, hand-painted fans. This is from the early 1800s, beautifully refined painting of the hands. You can see the weave of his fabric. It seems to, it's a simple fabric, but very, very luxurious. The sky brows on the woman um, up near the, the crown of her face are symbols of her nobility. He has beautifully shaded hair around the wig and the very tall abashi cap, and there you find the mark of their maker, Yamashina. That was his particular symbol to mark them. And wonderful symbols that appeared on their fabric, embroidered and woven in symbols on the fabrics. Very, very wonderfully done. Just as in a European dolls, many of the dolls that were made were representing historical, legendary, or theatrical dolls. And we're seeing here a wonderful wooden talismanic doll with characteristic red hair. This doll dates from about early 1800s, and it was designed as a talisman to ward against devastating uh, childhood diseases. The doll was designed to be placed near um, near a child with a belief that diseases would be attracted to the red hair of the doll rather than to the child. Now we see a portrait of a Hideyoshi. This was made circa 1840 and you notice he has the imperial crest. He's wearing a rare blue silk coat with black velvet details and black velvet guards. Um, this was very, Hideyoshi was a beloved person. He was um, in, important in developing things like the tea ceremony. And then we come on to a portrait of the historic hero Yoshitsune, early 1800s, again wearing the rare blue brocade silk with attached trousers and gold thread. He has lacquered paper armor with a dragon crest on his chest and black velvet accents. He has a kabuto helmet uh, with a dragon crest 
and he's considered by many to be one of the most important figures in the annual Boys' Day display. He was a brilliant and valiant leader, forced into exile by his brother, and then died at the age of only 33. Look at the beautiful fabrics. I think the reverence with which he was held is exemplified in this rare uh, fabric he is wearing. Perhaps a favorite of many is the Empress Jingo and her minister Tokenuchi, and here they are shown in rare grand size. This pair was made circa 1800. Even the pose is rare. They're shown in combat pose pre the birth of her child. Takenuchi, her attendant, is wearing a silk brocade um, outer robe with dragon and cloud motif, black dragon, black velvet details, yellow silk crepe obi, white silk under kimono with a flying crane, a silk brocade shoes with a toe guard. And it's absolutely wonderful. Please note that they carry matching battle fan, fans, which are very, very wonderful. And there is a portrait of his face. And you can see on his shoulders some of the variation in the fabrics that are being done. She is wearing a gauze outer robe with interwoven gold threads in a scroll pattern. You'll be seeing that in just a moment. There is that more of his uh, red lacquer that you're seeing, which is very, very rare to find. The black velvet is also quite rare. There is the flying crane. And here is the design on the battle fan, the close-up design on the battle fan of which they have matching battle fans. And you're seeing the little uh, wrist guards. And then more detail of the battle armament. She has um, gold. Look at that. Oh, that is just so luxurious. It's just absolutely wonderful. And you're seeing more details of a shield and the crest with the wonderful symbolic designs. This is on her. This is the Chi Chi Lion crest on the top of her armor. And then you are seeing the Empress herself with her gold lacquered hat, slightly open mouth with little painted teeth. Look at this wonderful sheer net uh, sleeves with gold embroidery on them. They are absolutely quite wonderful. And that is the back design of her, really showing her sleeves in great detail and her armament. The history and legend concerning the Empress Jingo and, and Takenichi are so um, convoluted and so so detailed, and it's hard to separate legend and history, but they are most beloved.